Dr. Kim Lewis, welcome. Um, he's a university distinguished professor and director of the Antimicrobial Discovery Center at Northeastern University in Boston. He's a fellow of the American Society of Microbiology and of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's authored over 100 papers and is an inventor on several patents. His notable findings include the development of general methods to grow previously uncultured bacteria that make up over 99% of the biodiversity on the planet. Also the discovery of the culprit of recalcitrant biofilm infections, drug tolerant persister cells and several novel antibiotics. So Dr. Lewis, we are very excited about having you speak to us today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian, for the kind introduction. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Uh, so if I can be enabled again, that'd be great. I'm not screen sharing. I'll disable I, it. I understand that you did not disable me, but uh, but so but somebody did, and uh, uh, would be great if that. Ah, okay. Here we go. Here we go. I am. Share screen. I'm back on track. Okay. You still can't. So oh, there we go. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. it's it's all good. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, I'll tell you about our efforts uh, to develop therapies uh, for Lyme disease, uh, and I'll uh, I'll start by uh, noting my disclosure. And then this is my introductory slide, which is superfluous given. Uh, Kim, can you make it any bigger? Uh, but uh, we really are interested both in acute and uh, PTLDS or chronic, whatever you call it, uh, Lyme disease. So uh, given that uh, symptomology of uh, chronic Lyme uh, overlaps with uh, some of the autoimmune diseases and and John now could uh, talk about, uh, spoke about that uh, earlier today. Uh, do we uh, took notice that uh, in a number of the, these autoimmune diseases like lupus or MS, uh, for example, there's a microbiome aberration. And uh, there are people and companies these days that are trying to uh, intervene with autoimmune diseases by fixing the microbiome. Uh, so it's sort of a productive line of research and we thought that that is worth taking a look uh, at. And so we did a couple of, I'll show you some key experiments here. Uh, so for starters, we uh, infect mice with Borrelia burgdorferi, and then we, uh, we look at the simple general readout, which is uh, whether the gut uh, remains intact or becomes leaky. Dysbiosis is a you know, telltale sign of a, of a leaky gut. And we you know, measure that by injecting uh, the blood with uh, uh, a fluorescently labeled dextran, large molecule that normally uh, doesn't, uh, I'm sorry, we feed the mice uh, with uh, fizzy dextran that normally doesn't go into the blood, it's a large molecule. Uh, and so uh, what we see is that uh, uh, over time here in red, there's a considerable difference as compared to uh, control mice that were not infected with Borrelia. So the gut becomes leaky. Uh, we also were curious to see whether not only this dextran will leak, but uh, whether bacteria will translocate. And it, it is known that when the gut becomes leaky, that's one of the things that happens is that bacteria from the gut translocate into mesenteric lymph nodes. And this is indeed what you see in the Borrelia infected mice by comparison. To the control, there's quite a big difference. Um, so, so then we uh, decided to look at uh, the microbiome of patients with PTLDS. This is a collaboration with John Alcott, Mark Soloski, and we, of course, took advantage of uh, the terrific you know, cohort of PTLDS that they uh, assembled. 
uh, and uh, also with Rob Knight on the computational part. Uh, and so what we see here uh, in this principal component analysis is a grouping uh, of the microbiome uh, diversity of patients with PLDS as compared to healthy, this is from American gut, very large cohort of healthy patients, or this is our sort of uh, uh, other control. These are patients that are in, in the ICU and heavily treated with antibiotics. So it looks something, there's something distinct here. Uh, now, we also took a look uh, at the history of these patients because some of them were treated with antibiotics, different antibiotics, different times. Uh, and so uh, we still have this grouping of healthy in blue, ICU in blue, and these are differently colored PTLDS patients depending on which antibiotics they took and, and when. And, and you see they still group together. So, uh, so it looks like something is happening here not because they were treated with antibiotics. Okay, and this is a machine learning uh, diagnostic, if you will. It asks the question, uh, if you compare uh, PTLDS versus the other groups, uh, what is the probability that you will be able to uh, correctly, uh, correctly diagnose, if you will, or uh, correctly assign that microbiome to one of these groups? If you uh, do that randomly, you, you'll be here on this diagonal line. The more you deviate from the diagonal, uh, the better your identification is. And so this machine learning tool predicts PTLDS in 82.4% of cases. Uh, this is, on the one hand, this is impressive. On the other hand, it's still, still I would say, er, preliminary because uh, 87 patients is a preliminary study. Now we need hundreds uh, of patients. And so uh, this company flight pad that I'm, that I'm associated with uh, it is now uh, conducting a very large uh, survey of hundreds uh, of patients. This is a collaboration with Illumin and it's providing the power uh, to sequence uh, the, these microbiomes. Um, okay. So, so, so what is it that is happening with the microbiome of some of these patients at, at the species, at the, at the genus and species level? So uh, one thing that we know is that uh, a group, a particular group of Blautia uh, spirochetes goes up and at the same time, bacteroides go down. Uh, bacteroides go down. So bacteroides are, are, are major symbionts. And another thing uh, that is happening, uh, if you look at, let's say, ICU patients, which is especially striking. In the ICU patients, you get this severe dysbiosis characterized by a takeover by uh, enterobacteriaceae like E. coli. Uh, and in the, quite a number of patients with PTLDS, we also see this uh, standard type of dysbiosis takeover with enterobacteriaceae. Okay, so from here we arrive at our working hypothesis, which is not terribly detailed as you, as you can see, uh, but basically what we think is happening is that Borrelia burgdorferi infection uh, causes changes uh, in the microbiome, not directly, of course, because you know Borrelia doesn't get into the gut. So it would have to do that through uh, changes in the immune system. Uh, and then treatment with broad spectrum does the same thing. I think these two factors conspire probably to ultimately cause uh, PTLDS. Um, I think that maybe paradoxically treatment with broad spectrum antibiotics can contribute uh, to PTLDS development. Just at the moment, we don't have any, any other way to treat acute Lyme disease, right? You have to give broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, and so the, uh, so, uh, this microbiome uh, alteration then uh, has to affect uh, probably the immune system and, and, and cause PTLDS. That's our working hypothesis. And so one of the elements at, at where we can interfere in this sequence of events uh, is instead of treating with prospectrum antibiotics, come up with something that doesn't harm the microbiome, something that's going to be selective against spirochetes. 
Uh, and uh, apart from the potential advantage that this may have in you know, pre preventing PTLDS development uh, and even treating patients with PTLDS that may have lingering infection, you, know, you really uh, you know, would rather treat that with a selective antibiotic that only takes out a particular type of pathogen rather than you know, wipe out your microbiome. Uh, uh, there is uh, just a general appreciation of the importance of the microbiome in human health, especially in younger, you know, people and children. The microbiome is very important for virtually um, any important aspect of health and disease. Uh, you know, the, uh, the nervous system, you know, mental health, uh, cardiovascular system, uh, of course, the GI tract, uh, uh, the immune system development, you, you name it. Uh, and there is a, uh, a movement, at least uh, at the conceptual side, uh, to move from, away from broad spectrum antibiotics to narrow spectrum or targeted, uh, more clever uh, therapies uh, in order to avoid that uh, very substantial side effect from broad spectrum companies. So uh, with that in mind, we initiated the search for such compounds and we developed a selective screen uh, using uh, soil bacteria as a source. Uh, and the, the screen is pretty straightforward. So uh, we screen against Borrelia burgdorferi and counter screen against Staph aureus. So any compound that hits both of them, like this one, for example, we're not interested in. We're only interested in something that will selectively hit a Borrelia. And of course, uh, this, search uh, is based on a guess because we don't know that nature uh, had a reason to evolve antibiotics that selectively kill spirochetes. Uh, but this search gave us a number of hits and we arrived at this compound, determined its structure, spent time. And that was a waste of time as it turned out, determining the structure. And because this is a known compound, hygromycin A, that was a very big surprise to me. I was surprised because I, I was convinced that whatever we find is going to be not, because I don't know of any uh, natural compound that is selective against spirochetes. Okay, so hygromycin A discovered in 1953 uh, from a collection that was assembled by Selman Waxman, who of course, you know, is the father uh, of the, ma of the sort of systematic golden era of antibiotic discovery. Now, he is the person who realized the screening soil lactinomyces is going to give us the major class of antibiotics. Yeah, and the reason why I never heard of this compound being, being in that field and being sort of reasonably educated in antibiotics is because nobody, nobody really cared about this compound. And nobody cared about this compound because it has very poor activity against bacteria in general. And, uh, you know, by the way, is pretty inactive against our gut symbionts. But here we, we tested against spirochetes, and here's where this compound really shines. Uh, it, it is uh, very potent. It is very potent and has no cytotoxicity whatsoever. Oh, the, the, yeah. So, uh, the, so the, the paper describing uh, our findings actually is coming out in Cell this week. So, uh, what else is interesting about this compound? Before I sort of go on to, to more uh, to more experimental part, uh, I will show you uh, the structure. I understand that most of the people in this audience are not chemists. But let me tell you, to tell you something, something simple. Look in this compound, you see all of these hydroxy groups. This is typically what you find on the sugar. This is a very hydrophilic, highly water-soluble compound. And so compounds like this normally don't penetrate across bacterial membranes. Because the membrane is greasy, you need some to be hydroph hydrophobic. Uh, uh, moieties to do that. So, so I, really, I, I really was puzzled. Uh, how this compound gets, uh, gets into spirochetes. So just keep that thought in mind for a moment. Uh, so here is uh, you know, a long table, uh, a long sort of version 
version of a table of what uh, uh, this compound uh, does. And here, uh, the important part is we take a closer look at the, at a longer list of uh, gut symbionts and find that it is ineffective against them. All right. So what do we know about this compound? In spite of its poor activity, it's interesting that uh, an, an academic lab in this, in the first in the eighties and then uh, fairly recently, like six years ago, decided to determine the mechanism of action of this compound. And it was found that it's a uh, ribosomal inhibitor. It inhibits uh, protein synthesis, inhibits translation. And uh, the group of, uh, 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 Tom Stites, who got the Nobel Prize for the structure uh, of the ribosome, and his uh, postdoc, uh, Yuri Polikanov, with whom we then collaborated, uh, determined the, uh, the crystal structure of the ribosome together with the compound. And uh, you know, it binds to 23S uh, RNA, and, and they determined the very particular nucleotides that it binds to. Now, the reason I am telling you this is because we looked at the sequence of 23, uh, 23 sRNA in, in Borrelia. And this is exactly the same in this region, right? So the binding is going to be exactly the same. And we actually went through uh, testing that or proving that experimentally. You know, was, maybe that's a little redundant, but we did do that. So uh, this is a, a, a very highly conserved target. And clearly you cannot base selectivity of this compound uh, on the differences between ribosomes of Borrelia and other bacteria. So, it has, so the reason for selectivity has to, has to be something else. So thinking about what the something else may be, especially given that uh, you know, the compound has no business penetrating uh, across bacterial membranes, uh, we're thinking that maybe there is a transport mechanism that brings uh, the compound into the cell. And this is indeed what happens. So in Borrelia burgdorferi, hygromycin A is rapidly, very rapidly taken up. Uh, and this is a comparison with E. coli, which where it is uh, considerably slower. So there is apparently an active mechanism that takes up hygromycin uh, A, explaining two things, how it gets into bacteria, well, into spirochetes and also why it's completely non-toxic to human cells. Uh, because uh, you see, when you see a, a more than 500 fold difference in, in toxicity, that tells you that something special is going on uh, there. And that special, I think, is, is this lack, lack of permeability. Right, so we uh, put in a, a very large effort trying to find the transport. Normally, it should not be a problem. You, you know, you get a resistant mutant, if a compound is brought in on a transporter, or you get a mutant that lacks that transporter, uh, you sequence the genome and you find the mutation of the transporter, piece of cake. Now that didn't happen. Very difficult to, to get any mutants resistant to hygromycin A. We did get uh, you know, two mutants, both of them in 23 uh, sRNA. Uh, hard to get in that target because Borrelia has two copies uh, of that gene. So that uh, is essentially a, a multi-target uh, or equivalent to a multi-target if we're talking about frequency of resistance. Uh, and then we thought, okay, well, maybe one of these mutants uh, actually has a, you know, a problem with uh, permeability and let's see uh, if there is uh, uh, anything interesting going on uh, in these mutants uh, regarding a transporter. So we did these, uh, did these two things. And here a transporter uh, shows up. So this is a decrease in uh, expression of this transporter. What does this transporter do? It transports nucleosides uh, into spirochetes. And it is essential in spirochetes. So you could not knock it out, right? That would explain why we don't get a uh, resistant mutant. Um, and indeed, this hygromycin resistant, resistant mutant takes up considerably less hygromycin A as compared uh, to a control. 
Um, so if you overexpress uh, the transporter, uh, you get uh, higher uh, potency uh, and uh, of, the, of this compound. Uh, and this uh, is, uh, uh, it's by comparison, by comparison, <clears throat> uh, uh, sort of uh, the wild type and uh, and the oh, and the mutant that overexpresses uh, the the transporter, uh, but uh, ceftriaxin has no difference uh, comparing the wild type uh, with overexpression. Okay, so uh, what else uh, would you hear? Um, uh, we certainly look at a, a mouse model of Borrelia infection. Uh, and oops, just a moment, there's some interfering going on. Um, and what we see is that uh, by uh, IP injection, uh, hygromycin A uh, clears uh, the infection. This is uh, by culture positivity. Uh, just as uh, ceftriaxone. But uh, importantly, uh, hygromycin A also clears infection by oral gavage. Uh, this is the minimal dose that uh, we find clears the infection. And so do, of course, amoxicillin and uh, doxycycline. Now, an important thing is that we were, again, we're not able to observe any toxicity we went up to uh, 2,000, uh, so two, two grams per kg a day, enormous dose. Um, and we saw no toxicity. We also performed, so NIH also um, funded a fairly large detailed tox study that was performed by a CRO uh, for this. And they measured you know, the standard uh, uh, number of parameters, genotoxicity, you know, HERC toxicity, CYP receptor toxicity, kidney toxicity, on and on and on, um, and found no red flags. So everything is, is within normal. Uh, so this is, a, you know, in my experience, it's very surprising. The goal when you do detailed uh, toxicity, uh, in, in this is in rats. When you do detailed toxicity, the question is, not are you going to get an non-toxic compound, you're always going to get toxicity. The question is, what is the toxicity target? What is the target? So what's the main organ where you see toxicity? And then you can think about, okay, where's your therapeutic window? How are you going to dose? Or, or can you use some mitigation sort of, uh, uh, you know, other medication to mitigate that toxicity, right? So here, now we uh, unexpectedly see a very clean a report uh, from our uh, from our toxicity study uh, where there is none. All right, so now uh, we look at uh, the effect of uh, hygromycin A on the microbiome of mice. Uh, and let me first uh, show you what we find with uh, uh, controls. And the controls are amoxicillin oral or ceftriaxin subcutaneous. Uh, and you see what happens here is uh, a, a very typical result, a bloom of a particular pathogen. Here it's an enterococci bloom, sometimes it's E. coli blooming. So what happens is that you, you get the resistant mutant uh, and uh, that resistant mutant is blooms uh, because the rest of the microbiome is suppressed, right? So the broad spectrum antibiotic suppresses the rest of the microbiome and the lucky resistant mutant blooms and then and can essentially takes over the microbiome, right? So this is the reason why we don't want broad spectrum. We could, would like to avoid broad spectrum antibiotics if at all possible. Uh, and it is important that amoxicillin here is given orally. It's not even, uh, it's, uh, 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 and this wipes out. And even more impressively, ceftriaxin subcutaneous. So subcutaneous, uh, 
So that means a sufficient amount of this antibiotic leaks into the gut. Uh, and uh, this leakage is enough uh, you know, to cause this uh, really dramatic change. All right. So by comparison, hygromycin doesn't do much. Uh, so there is a bit of an increase in symbiotic uh, streptococci and, and lactobacillus. Uh, okay. So here are a couple of papers that uh, I think Brian asked me uh, to include. Yeah, one more thing I wanted to add about hygromycin A is that uh, Albany Molecular, that's uh, the big outfit that does uh, industrial scale fermentation, uh, has developed for us uh, an industrial process for producing uh, this compound. So the bacteria that we isolated from soil makes it at a very high level, 120 milligrams per liter. Just to give you a comparison, you typically when we isolate the new antibiotic uh, from a soil microorganism, we're very happy if they make it at one milligram per liter. Right, so this is 120. And that tells me, I was very puzzled. How was it in 1953, how was that compound discovered? Because it's such a lousy antibiotic unless you screen it against spirochetes. Well, it was discovered because it's produced an enormous amount. So we give that uh, strain in our conditions, et cetera, to Albany Molecular. Albany Molecular ignores our strain, ignores our condition, does their screen of both strains and conditions and comes back to us and says that they're now producing a two grams per liter in their ferment, which is a, an amazing uh, really amount, which means that this compound uh, is going to be uh, produced in the abundant quantity, is going to be very cheap to make. I just rig up a big fermenter and you can turn out uh, you know, really copious amounts uh, of this compound. So we'll see how it goes. So, so far it's going well. Uh, and it is our hope uh, that we will be able to initiate uh, an IND study on the basis of what we got so far. And uh, we'll move into phase one with this uh, compound that will be dedicated to specifically treating Lyme disease. Uh, so with that, uh, I wanted to you know, thank my, uh, my team, collaborators and, and support. And I also wanted to thank uh, uh, Lyme Disease Association because they helped me get started uh, with uh, a Lyme investigation a number of years ago. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Uh